This week on Arizona Illustrated, A Mountain's 100 Years. When I see the A, I know that we're home. Two and four up to the middle, then they come right back. The life of a square dance caller. Urban raptors. The challenge, I think, is to really deal with the processes that are affecting wildlife at the broadest scales. And Charlie Sheen in Tucson, from the vault. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. In 1916, war gripped much of the world. The first woman was elected to Congress, and Mexican General Francisco Pancho Villa invaded the U.S. and was chased back into Mexico by General John J. Pershing and 15,000 U.S. troops. Closer to home, University of Arizona students and staff constructed a huge Block A on nearby Sentinel Peak. The 70-foot wide, 160-foot tall A has become a local icon and gave the peak its nickname, A Mountain. The A to me means University of Arizona, and I'm an alumni, so um, I've been aware of the A since I started school many years ago. I currently live near here, and I can see the A from my yard, so um, it, it's, you know, a, a good thing to, to look at. When we travel, at times we travel to Phoenix, and, you know, we're driving home, and I see the A, I know that, that we're home. We've been down here 11 years in the wintertime as snowbirds, and uh, we've always seen the A in the mountain, but never, never been up here, so uh, we took the opportunity today with our friends to come up and it's a spectacular view. You can see practically as far as forever, I guess you would say. We have guests today from Minnesota and we love to show them the area and get a good view of Tucson. And they were surprised that it, it's as old as it is. The students of the U of A built it in 1915. Here you see the students, the original student body group who are constructing the A. That's a, a big assembly line of them actually placing the rocks um, into an A formation on Sentinel Peak. As you can see, there's a lot of work going on. They have shovels and axes, and so they're trying to you know, lay a stable foundation for the A itself. So this photo is from September 23rd, 1916, the first lighting of the A. It's a great job to be able to, to leaf through the, the pages of history here at the university. You can see from this picture a lot, even though it's a, a shot, it's not a student, so it was both students and um, professors who partook in the construction of the A. It really does reflect the era, and students dress more formally in um, trousers and jackets, and the University of Arizona had a dress code at the time, and so, um, most students, uh, male students, were required to wear trousers, jackets, and if they were freshmen, they had to wear a, a, a little cap. It's not like we have today where you have students who have um, flip-flops on and shorts and, and that sort of thing. So going to school at the university was a much more formal affair. These photographs are um, some of the first images of the A once it was completed in 1916. One of the interesting things about these two pictures was that they were taken um, via a telescope by Andrew Ellicott Douglas. And Douglas was a, a known astronomer and faculty member here at the University of Arizona. And it's a five inch telescope that was borrowed from Harvard University. So this was a um, the first image of the, the A itself, and also a shot taken with the first telescope that has, was ever on campus here at the University of Arizona. When I read that A Mountain had been completed in 1916, uh, I was kind of amazed that it was that old. 
because we do uh, greeting cards here for our clients that are locally themed, I thought, well, that's a good occasion to send something out as an acknowledgement of the fact that we're Tucson-based and that it's the 100th anniversary of an iconic symbol for Tucson. The cards have been very well received. We've gotten a number of emails and phone calls uh, from people who were kind of delighted about the tie-in with Tucson's uh, iconic symbol or the fact that it was a coloring card that uh, capitalizing on that trend of adult coloring books right now. This is a wide shot from 1951 and as you can see, um, the road that we know today that goes up to the A is firmly established there. This photo was gifted to the University Special Collections from a former student. So most of these um, photos that you're looking at today come from direct gifts from alumni. So one of our more recent, older historical pictures of the painting of the A comes from this photograph here, which is, was taken in 1964. And as you can see, in the middle 60s, it was still uh, a popular tradition here at the University of Arizona, with hundreds of students participating in the painting. It was just a wonderful time. We had a lot of fun. Um, and the memories of the U of A, I think for my generation, uh, they wanted to give back. They were very involved at that time and they're very involved to this day. I don't know how often they paint it, but we've been down here when it's been red, another time when it's been blue, one time when it was red, white, and blue. <laughs> As I drive down and see the A, I'm, I'm, I know I'm home. Even though you don't live there? Uh, even though I don't live there. I was raised in Tucson, so I was raised with the A being just a part of the landscape. So for me, it's a connection with home. I was born and raised here in Arizona, and um, the A has always been a fixture as, as part of my life. My grandparents have a house on Main Street, so part of one of our um, traditions was going down on 4th of July and looking and being right under the A. I love it, it's my home. <laughs> I love being home. As we often reveal here on Arizona Illustrated, we are surrounded by extraordinary people. Marshall Flippo is certainly one of those. Flippo has been a square dance caller for almost 70 years, and he's still calling right here in Southern Arizona. Square dancing dates back to 17th century England and was common throughout Europe before making its way to North America with European settlers. Almost half of the United States claim it as their official state dance. This is the Kanoa Hills Social Center in Green Valley, Arizona. Every Monday night we have a dance, and then there's another one Wednesday at Recon where Filippo usually is. Folks are guided through a square dance by what is known as the caller. He only comes down here once in a while, so this is really exciting for us, you know. My name is Marshall Filippo. I'm 88. I'm a square dance caller. He goes by Flip or Flippo. Only his mother called him Marshall. I'm calling him square dance here tonight. Marshall Flippo. Man, he is one of the very best. You see, the caller has to keep track of who the corners are, and so he gets everybody back together by the end of the dance. And he's really good at getting everybody back together. Well, I'm hoarse right now. I'm, I'm going to have to give me some hot coffee. Hey, thank you very much. Yeah, he's great. But, you know, because he's been in it so long, he has so much experience, and he loves people. And that's what draws us back to him. You can just tell that he just loves all of us, and, and it's mutual. So. I hope you have a good time, despite the calling term you're going to say you're lucky to have me. Well, there's eight people in a square. 
four couples. There's two head couples and two side couples. What a beautiful day. Get them squared up and you gotta watch the floor. Try to get everybody through everything. All eight to the middle, little back wide. Circle to the left, come down to go. Circle to the left, on heel and toe. And reverse trail the other way back in single file. I just got out of the Navy when I was 21 in World War II. Two years later, I started calling. That's about all my life. Two and four up to the middle, and they come right back. Touch one quarter. That boy run around that girl. And run on it He and his wife, Nisha, first learned to square dance at a club in Abilene, Texas. I didn't want to go to the first class. But the first class are right and left, granddad's right, left, right, left, and then you promenade. But the touching of hands really got me. Uh, it's just a joyful dance, it really is. It's a good activity for anybody, really. And the small kids, uh, you see a lot of small kids that can dance pretty good. And they're quick to learn. His first foray into calling began on a friend's farm just south of Abilene. He was 23 years old. And he said, hey, I got a chicken coop and dance about three squares. If we get three squares out there, we can dance every Friday night just to records. Swing through. Flippo learned all the calls that lead dancers through the square. Load the boat, relay the deucey, recycle, linear cycle. Veer left, veer right, square through, right and left through, pass through. It just goes on, on and on and on and on. And then it gets up to another level, which we call advanced. Well, bow to your partner, now the girl to the left. Then join hands and circle left. Circle this is a recording of Marshall Flippo calling in 1961. Circle right, circle right and around you go. With a lady on the right, a half sashay. That's a cheap way to have fun. It's a great equalizer, too, because you'd be dancing with a millionaire and you might, I'll have a cent. I'm the one with no cent. But you learn, and, and then you meet a lot of really, really nice people. And you get close to people. You, we've had really close friends. Some of his friends were fellow callers, and they shared their ideas about calling. I working with other guys and uh, stealing their stuff and researched. This fellow's name is Joe Lewis, and this guy's name is Bob Page. He's been dead a long time. What a guy. Both of these guys were excellent callers. That, that, that happens to be me. Boy, look at there. I wish I had my belt up there now. Everyone is so friendly and loving, and we try and help each other. So that's part of it. It's a social group, and the other part is just pure dancing. And you can kind of do your own thing, even though you're following calls. You can still get your own rhythm going. And he's so patient with us, you know, when things don't quite go right, he'll make you do it over again. And then we'll get it right. Now center sweep a quarter. The same two lead out to the right, or your right. His most famous call is The Auctioneer, recorded in 1958, based on the song by Leroy Van Dyke. Go down that middle cross trail to go up the outside around just two when you meet your girl. Swing around so neat. And it took off and pretty soon people were riding me and all. And uh, that's another break. Well, I've been in the right place at the right time, and uh, things just happened when I started recording. After a square dance vacation at Lake of the Ozarks Resort in central Missouri, they offered him a position as staff caller. Went well, there's another break, big break. 42 years I stayed there. Interest in square dancing has cycled over the years, and today, numbers are down. Well, you used to have a festival, you knew it was going to be a big sucker, you know, and uh, it seemed like when bowling came in, the early 50s, 
Everybody and their dogs were bowling. We thought square dance is gone because bowling had taken over. But that, that was just a, a drip and a drop. And uh, it came back, but I don't know. It's dropped really bad this time. Yeah. Hard to get a class, very hard. Flippo says he's winding down his days of traveling and calling on the road. I, I met, a, you know, lots and lots of friends that I've never seen anymore. A lot of them are gone now and uh, gone, gone, gone. Everybody loves him, and uh, we've grown to love him too, you know, and uh, so we didn't want to miss tonight. Turn out of the corner of the hall, give yourself a big hand, y'all. I want them to have a good time. That's, that's the only thing. Just have a good time. Like what you see on Arizona Illustrated? Visit our webpage at azpm.org to watch and share videos from this episode. You'll also find stories from future programs. An easy way to submit your own story idea. An archive of past episodes of Arizona Illustrated and you'll find everything you need to stay connected with public broadcasting in Southern Arizona, azpm.org. The Spanish settlement of the Tucson region over 300 years ago changed not only the cultural and political landscape, but also the actual landscape itself. The exotic plants brought in over the intervening centuries have altered the native Sonoran Desert habitat, which has affected many of the original animal species some for the better, and some for the worse. There's sort of a joke about raptors. All they really need to inhabit a place is to fit within the thermal profile of a place, give them a place for a nest and something to eat, and they'll, and they'll inhabit that place. And, and that isn't exactly true, but it's, it could be generally thought of as true. In some ways, if you look at the Tucson Basin and think about what it was early on in its history before humans settled in any meaningful way, it had sort of a scrubland. But now what we've done is sort of converted into much more of a forest, like a sort of semi-tropical forest. You can find lots of those kinds of trees and other ones brought in from other places that have some of those same sort of tall, larger characteristics all over town. And they're subsidized by water and fertilizer, so we have created this relatively rich, sort of thriving, high productivity environment in an arid system. Early on in Tucson's history, some of those species, like Cooper's hawks, might have been here originally, but they were sort of restricted to the riparian areas, that's sort of most wet places in the region. For the Cooper's hawk, one of the world's most skilled flyers, the exotic trees that humans have brought with them provide opportunities. The Cooper's hawk has made the best of the towering eucalyptus from Australia and the giant Aleppo pine native to the Mediterranean. They use the trees primarily for perches and most importantly for nesting. The eggs are incubated for about 30 days and then once they hatch they stay in the nest for another 30 days or so and then for another month or so they uh, are in the nest area uh, and being fed and eventually are weaned begin to hunt on their own. The male does all the hunting, provisioning food for the female and nestlings from the beginning of the nesting cycle until they fledge basically. Cooper socks generally uh, eat birds and that's part of the reason they're so abundant in town and urban areas tend to have a tremendous amount of food in terms of bird life available for them. So. Uh, the nesting densities are quite high here, probably as a result of that abundance of food. Not all raptors adjust equally to human presence. The largest raptor in North America, the golden eagle, avoids the same urban areas the Cooper's hawk seeks out. The presence of tall trees, lush green lawns, and the water that comes with them tends to help out the most mobile animals. Those benefits are not equal across the animal kingdom. Any of the changes that humans introduce to a place is inevitably going to be good for some species and bad for other species. The downside of that usually is that we tend to make environments that are relatively homogeneous, things that humans like in a place, like park settings. 
The downside of that is often what we lose are the species that have sort of unique habitat requirements, is that there is something special about that place that um, encourage them to live there, to inhabit that sort of place, and often those are lost in, this, in these sort of transitions. So when we change the land use of a place from, from its native sort of setting to uh, the sort of suburban sort of common footprint that we see is, is often the, the things that are novel, the species that are novel in a place tend to be displaced. Even for those species, like the Cooper's hawk, whose existence in the city is easier overall, there are added dangers that come with the urban life. One of the primary agents of mortality for adult Cooper's hawks uh, in these urban areas is flying into windows. Cooper's hawks and other birds can't distinguish between reflection and reality, so they see a reflection in the window as a place to fly, and so they fly into them and, and injure or sometimes kill themselves. It's frequently in pursuit of other, other birds, so it's not uncommon for us to get a call from a homeowner to say they heard two thuds on, outside their home and go outside and find a, a dead dove and a, and a dead hawk uh, beside it after having crashed into the window. Another unseen but fatal hazard for raptors is electricity, carried in the wires atop the poles scattered across the city by the electric utility, TEP. We've worked with uh, Tucson Electric Power over the last um, 10 years to develop a program to reduce the number of electrocuted birds uh, in Tucson. It, it's primarily focused on those larger bodied birds like red tail hawks and great horned owls and Harris's hawks. The program in the last five or six years has become really effective and that we, we think it's making a big difference. While it's nearly impossible to insulate all the poles, the significant reduction in raptor fatalities is directly linked to TEP's efforts. Other actions to mitigate the human impact on urban wildlife are also happening on a much smaller scale, even in backyards. People talk about trying to do things like uh, create local spaces for wildlife and I, and I think all of that's positive you know we we feed birds uh, mostly that's for our benefit rather than theirs we create sort of small spaces hummingbird gardens and, and all that stuff is, is really great the challenge I think is to really deal with the processes that are affecting wildlife at the broadest scales so we can make small scale changes with plantings maybe returning some native vegetation in developed areas um, that are going to be a net positive but the real challenge is to think about how to address the sort of adverse effects that are happening at the greatest scales. That is a real challenge in general. It's uncertain how humans will address these large-scale challenges in the future, but there are still opportunities to enjoy some of those species that have successfully adjusted to the changes of the past. And it's fun, even this morning when I woke up, I was sitting in the back with a cup of coffee, and I hear two Cooper's hawks calling from different places, and they're having a story. And, you know, even though I realize that that's a consequence of changes that humans have wrought, I still sort of enjoy it. So I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with taking advantage of some of the consequences of the things that we've done, for better or for worse. When you think of Arizona's film history, the great westerns come to mind. The Searchers, Red River, and Tombstone, as do the film stars, Glenn Ford, John Wayne, Jimmy Stewart, and Charlie Sheen. Yep, in a 1988 film, the crew and the cast, including Charlie Sheen, came to shoot in Tucson. But it wasn't the old west they were looking for, it was baseball. Movie making. It may look like fun, but really it's a lot of hard work, especially during the hot, muggy, monsoon season days in Tucson. The movie is called Major League. It is produced by Chris Chesser, who has a very special reason for being excited about the film being made in Tucson. The simple answer is that the picture is about the Cleveland Indians, Peggy, and therefore why not shoot the spring training portion of the picture where the Indians really train. The film people here are very cooperative, and also I'm from here. I was raised a couple blocks from the stadium, grew up watching the Indians, and uh, as it turned out, that didn't make any difference, but if there got to be some compelling reasons to not come to Tucson, I would have done my best to come here anyway. The stars of the film are Charlie Sheen and Tom Berenger, both well-known for their roles in the Oscar-winning Platoon. Also on hand was Dodger great Steve Yeager, who is working as a consultant on the film. 
Because only a minor part of the movie Major League is going to be filmed in Tucson, the production is expected to pump only about $100,000 into the Tucson economy. That, of course, is only a ballpark figure. Tom Hildebrand runs the city's film commission, which has the job of attracting film companies to Tucson. Total budget, I'm told, on the film is approximately $10 million. But we're happy in this environment we're working in with the writer's strike and everything to, uh, to have them here. It's, uh, it's great because we've been down this year from production. Fans were on hand today, although as the heat and humidity went up, their numbers began to go down. Free drinks and hot dogs helped, as did the attraction of seeing stars. Most of my memories are from spring training watching the Indians, and it seems sort of the same. Seeing all these people here reminds me of just a regular crowd for the Indians during spring training. Thank you for joining us here on Arizona Illustrated. Next week, the art and artists behind Tucson's downtown murals. Life lessons through purposeful percussion. A place to cool down for those who don't have a place. And building the biosphere in 1989. I'm Tom McNamara. See you next week.